Uh, we'll welcome everybody to our Road to Net Zero Climate Change and Trade webinar. Um, we're hoping today that you'll uh, get a lot out of uh, our two expert speakers and the implications of the uh, latest trade deals and situations that might arise in the future with climate change and, and trade barriers. Um, before we go ahead with that, um, I'd like to let you know that we uh, are taking questions in this webinar format at the Q on the bottom of your screens with the Q&A section. So if you put a question in there, I shall read them out for everybody. Otherwise, you can use um, Slido, which is an app on your phone if you don't have a computer with you. Uh, and it, the uh, code for that is hashtag FCA. Um, so I think that's pretty much all we need to go through. This is being recorded. There will be a uh, copy put up on our website probably by tomorrow, knowing how quick Fiona gets to these things. Um, I think that's about all I've got to say as far as housekeeping goes. Um, I firstly would like to introduce uh, Wendy Cohen. Wendy is our CEO and uh, Wendy comes from a, uh, a rural background um, and she is currently, for those who wish to know where Wendy is, is in Canberra. So she's operating out of our Canberra office. Uh, we have people in a great many places across Australia, so um, that might help people get a bit of location. And Wendy's been with us for over 12 months now um, and helping and growing FCA from strength to strength. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Wendy. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, yes, coming to you from very warm and sunny Canberra. Uh, so welcome everyone to Farmers for Climate Action's second webinar in our Road to Net Zero series, Climate Change and Trade. And of course, we're coming to you live from this National Ag Day, which is wonderful and uh, most appropriate. I'm sure um, most of you are aware of Farmers for Climate Action. We're a movement of farmers um, and rural and regional Australians uh, committed to and passionate about climate action. Um, we are 5,000 strong in our farmer network and we're thrilled to be able to bring you cutting edge uh, discussion topics, webinars and information about ways that uh, agriculture in Australia be can become more sustainable um, and, and, uh, and, and more productive uh, in the face of climate impact. Most importantly, and to begin with, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land I live on, the Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land that you are all joining us from right now. We are in extraordinary times with political developments here and globally, the pandemic and the lasting impacts of climate change. Uh, the way we manage the risks and opportunities for Australian agriculture on the world stage are more important now than ever. We have two exceptional guests joining us today to talk with us about the road ahead for agriculture, the speed humps, the twists and turns, and also about what farming and the food and fibre industry can do to maximise the business and trade opportunities. Huge thanks to Ash and Angus. We're thrilled uh, that you're joining us today and we're really grateful for your time and for you adding your voice, experience and insights to our understanding of how Australian farmers can manage their businesses to reta retain and expand on exports. Thanks again, Pete, back to you. Back to me, uh, very good. Um, now, first up today, we've got Ash Saladin and Ash is going to give us a general talk about trade and um, climate implications. And that will be followed by Angus Island, who will give us a more detailed um, expose on trade to Europe and the wool industry. So I'd like to point out that Ash um, joined the NFF in 2020 as Chief Economist and General Trade Manager. Prior to that, he was uh, the Chief Economist at the New South Wales Farmers, Farmers Association and he was also uh, the lead at government affairs and public policy at Rabobank. Ash has developed a passion for competition and energy policies for rural Australia. 
and I uh, Ash is at the uh, NFF headquarters today, but he grew up in Tasmania and Sydney, and he studied economics and law at the University of Sydney. So thank you for joining us today, Ash. I hand over to you. Uh, thank you, Peter, and uh, thanks uh, Farmers for Climate Action for putting together this webinar on, on a very important and uh, very topical uh, issue. So look, I won't introduce myself. I think Peter's done a very good job of uh, introducing me, so I'll, I'll skip to that. Well, I'll quickly sort of outline who the NFF is, and I'm sure most people already know, but we represent the broad church that is the agricultural sector in Australia, from state farming organisations um, to specific commodity groups, whether they be beef, horticulture, red meat, um, you name it, we represent them, bar a couple of caveats, which um, include seafood and wine. So um, we'll just sort of uh, maybe highlight who we don't represent might be easier. As a part of that broad church, um, Farmers for Climate Action are um, indeed a very important and, and most welcome member, uh, having been um, sort of uh, with the NFF um, over the last couple of years and um, they've formalised their participation uh, more recently. So um, very much um, appreciate the, uh, the work that FCA does and um, the input they put into our policies and our, um, our advocacy um, agenda. So moving on to the issue of um, climate and carbon. Uh, this issue sort of forms um, a bigger discussion for the ag sector and, and beyond around sustainability and the value of um, sustainability for farmers and, and beyond the farm gate. Today, what I'll try to do where possible is give you a value free um, sort of ideology free as to some of the opportunities and challenges around carbon and sustainability um, and then focus on some farm implications. I know that's a tough task, but um, really just try to focus on what's coming up, what could be the opportunity, what, what could be the implications, what could be the challenges. And I think sort of the issues around climate and carbon unnecessarily become fraught and um, entangled with ideology and um, where possible we, we, we at the NFF like to avoid that. Um, and the example I'll probably give is that ANZ recently announced that it would be um, stepping away from um, the use of or investing in uh, coal and also seeking that its suppliers um, equally sort of um, have a strategy around uh, decarbonizing, particularly around the use of coal by 2030. Now, um, I don't know if you sort of picked up the, um, the the media mentions of this. It blew up into a huge political issue, and then you know calls for divestment and um, and, and you know um, pulling loans from ANZ. Now, uh, that that might be a little bit of an overreaction, um, a very emotional reaction to. Um, what, what that, that, that concern might or might not entail. So where possible today, I'll try to focus purely on the opportunities and challenges. So I guess, um, why is carbon becoming important? Why should we care? And there's really three points to highlight here. The first point is around that customers and supply chains are beginning to demand uh, action on carbon mitigation and carbon re reduction, both domestically and abroad. The second issue is around the costs and access to finance. Banks and the financial sector, again, domestically and abroad, have been asked to take into account um, the risk of climate um, and, and um, carbon emissions on their loan portfolio and their, their, their financial um, products. And the final um, issue, which is probably the main issue of today, is around um, trade and the fact that um, carbon could, um, and sort of there's already sort of um, intentions out there to, um, increasingly become a market access issue. Um, and, and European Union might be the probably the, the, the most pertinent sort of um, example today. So I'll go through the, each of these points um, in a little bit more detail um, today. So the first one is around customer demand. And when I talk about customer, I'm, I'm really focusing on large supermarkets, um, food and fiber manufacturers and other retailers. Um, in reality, these are our customers as farmers. Um, the consumer is more of the end user and is probably the customer of the of the retailer or the supermarket. So it's really um, sort of important that we understand what these stakeholders are doing and demanding. Now, the supermarket sector is probably the best um, sort of uh, example to focus on. And in the UK, large supermarkets such as Sainsbury have committed to carbon neutrality by 2040. And this includes working with their suppliers to gain commitments from them uh, to reduce emissions, um, including agreeing on metrics and reporting on emissions in the short term. Now, 
usually what happens in Europe, um, sort of five to 10 years down the track, you start seeing um, it happening in Australia. And in September, Woolworths pledged to um, cut its emission by 60% by 2030 with a view to net zero emissions by 2050. And this really came about by significant uh, investment uh, pressure on Woolworths um, to make um, sort of more uh, concrete pledges around um, carbon emissions. Now, in terms of how it might affect suppliers, nothing has been announced around getting commitments from Woolworths suppliers um, or, or putting mandates on their supply chain. But uh, if sort of animal welfare and other areas are any guide or indication of how Woolworths op operates, uh, they are very good at dictating behavior up and down the supply chain. So again, I'm not saying this will happen or, or, or won't happen. I'm just saying that, look, um, that there is a movement towards um, this kind of um, supply chain type mandates by uh, retailers and, and beyond. So that's really sort of um, from a customer perspective and, and the pressures on them and, and how those pressures then relate to um, their suppliers where farmers are equally a, a supply to these um, supply chains. Now, the next interesting area is the area of um, access to finance. Now, in 2019, both APRA and the RBA highlighted that the banks need to um, account for climate and carbon emissions as a risk in their prudential um, frameworks. Now, what does that mean in plain English? Um, it means that regulators are flagging to banks that they need to manage climate risk. Or if they don't manage their climate risk, they have to hold more capital uh, for the loans that they provide to customers. Now, what does that mean? If you hold more capital, um, it means your cost of capital goes up, which means you, you, you have to provide um, more expensive loans, so higher interest rates. So there's a real impact um, in, in terms of um, the start of the discussion around including climate change um, into sort of prudential regulations and it could impact farmers. Now, whether Australian policy moves on carbon or not is irrelevant um, in terms of the prudential regulations. Um, money markets are global markets and a lot of the regulation and standards are set globally. Um, for example, capital adequacy ratios are set um, internationally um, in Basel. So the, there's the Basel Accords and um, a lot of the money we get in our, that banks get uh, um, obtained from foreign um, money markets. And it's interesting to note that the European um, Central Bank has clearly stated that they will start to account for and cost the cost of carbon in money markets. So regardless of what happens in Australia, uh, banks over the next five to 10 years will have to start accounting more for climate and climate change. Now, how can banks account um, for this risk? There's probably two ways they can do this. One, they can try to mitigate the risk of carbon at a macro level. And so that could be activities like the ones we've mentioned around divesting from coal and um, you know activities that sort of try to um, change behavior at a macro level. But the other thing they can do is select customers with low exposure to climate or have, has a low emissions profile. And if the second route is heavily relied upon, that could be a vulnerability for the farming sector and, and for the agricultural sector. And this accounting for um, carbon um, uh, performance and, um, and mitigation is already sort of um, informing bank practices here and um, overseas. And the, the best example is that in New Zealand, um, some banks are now looking at the agricultural sector and going to farm and trying to get an understanding of the sustainable sustainability profile and performance of individual farms as clients. Now, currently this is being done um, through survey and through discussions with their customers. Um, and it's more of a carrot approach where they say, look, you know, we'll provide incentives um, you just need, need to account for it. You need to start to measure it and, and demonstrate um, sort of um, uh, sort of what your plans are around these things. And you know, we might um, sort of provide you with um, uh, better sort of um, terms for your financial products. But going forward and noting that there'll be a real cost to to carbon um, in money markets. That, you know, that the stick could come out and through sort of higher sort of um, interest rates or um, sort of more restricted um, access to finance in the future. So. You know, that's a New Zealand example. Um, banks have been dabbling in sort of similar approaches in Australia, though I, I haven't sort of seen anyone that's sort of come out to market as yet um, um, 
similar to the one in New Zealand. And I dare say in the European Union, uh, this kind of thing is probably more um, advanced and sort of uh, further down the road as well. Now coming to the sort of the, the final of the three sort of um, areas where I think carbon will become more important and that's around trade. And I, I think uh, Angus will go a lot uh, more deeply into um, how this will play out and whether um, some of the implications around trade barriers and restrictive trading practices. But again, I'll just highlight what the movement is and I think Angus will sort of give a little bit more color as to um, the issues. So as an example, the EU is considering implementing a carbon border tax. What this basically entails is a tax on goods and services um, according to the emissions attributed to those goods. So um, the one exception is if the producing country uh, has a carbon price in place that is um, recognized and um, is um, um, integrated with the uh, European system, um, then the, the carbon tax um, would not apply to those traded goods. Now, whether this is protectionist or not, uh, and whether WTO would see this as protectionist or not is another matter. I'm only highlighting what the European Union intention is. And if that intention comes to fruition, essentially there will be a tariff placed on goods um, based on their, uh, their, their carbon profile. And I do like to note that the EU has a long history of using sustainability, environmental and other standards um, as protectionist tools. And sometimes um, what they do and don't do aren't necessarily for some sort of uh, enlightened behavior, but uh, nevertheless, um, that is where the European Union is going. Now, there's also been some talk that the, the United States with a uh, Biden presidency will also start to highlight issues around climate and uh, carbon emissions more uh, forcefully and potentially um, look at um, trade options around um, carbon and, um, and, and climate change. Though I think that that's speculation at this point in time. So where does this leave the, the ag industry in Australia? And I guess from an ag industry perspective, we have to note that this is the environment that we, we are playing in. And this probably informs why um, organizations such as ourselves, the NFF have committed to a, a net zero, um, uh, carbon zero uh, emissions target by 2050, while others such as, such as the cattle industry has set more ambitious targets um, around a net zero by 2030. Um, regardless of ideology, um, regardless, and look, I understand uh, I'm talking to a forum that's <laughs> probably um, um, sort of more um, sort of accepting of this, um, this agenda, but there's also other forums and other um, stakeholders who are sort of fight this issue tooth and nail. But I guess the point we're trying to make, regardless of what your ideology is, the environment we're playing in, this thing will have a cost and they will have a benefit. And, and all we're trying to do is highlight the costs and benefit and the next thing is to, um, to address that as an industry. So where we want to go with, uh, with this um, from NFF is to ensure that this, um, this pathway to a net zero emissions is done through carrots, um, not sticks for the um, agricultural sector. So where we can provide incentives to, the, um, to industry to um, begin this pathway down to net zero versus creating costs and barriers to, um, to production and, uh, and to, um, to development. So really that, that's one of our main concerns. And I guess why I would say agriculture is slightly distinct from most other industries is that we are, for want of a better word, a natural system. And you know, natural systems take a, a, a longer period of time and requires more investment um, to change, including in terms of um, um, trying to reduce and, um, and, and uh, capture emissions, for example. So noting that sort of, um, sort of um, dealing with the natural environment, we are so our policies are really focused on um, providing as many carrots to the, to the sector versus um, sticks. And this leads to the next issue around opportunities for farmers. Now, there's some very low hanging fruit here and pardon the, the agricultural pun there, but um, a really sort of um, low hanging fruit is around uh, carbon and sort of environmental offsets or sustainability offsets. Now, these, have benefits just beyond the, the revenue that comes from those offsets. One of the things that they do, they provide counter cyclical um, revenue to farmers, particularly to things like climate. So, you know, if you have a sustainability or a biodiversity or a carbon offset on your farm, uh, that pr provides perpetual income and it's unaffected by uh, climatic or weather conditions. So you, you might be during a drought 
but those offsets will still generate income um, for your uh, for your farm. So the benefits are beyond just the pure money that it provides um, in a one-off basis. is It is actually a very good risk management tool for farmers. Now, the other opportunities, obviously, as the banking sector moves on uh, climate change is to lower costs and access to finance. If you can demonstrate your sustainability and your carbon credentials, um, and particularly with easy and right-sized and um, appropriate um, certification and verification processes, it could be an opportunity for farmers to demonstrate their credentials and then um, use that to access cheaper finance. Um, from a trade perspective, I might sound sort of a note of not an alarm, but of caution, because um, what I would suggest is um, whether the European Union um, places um, a tax on carbon or not on trade um, is not so much to get um, environmental or climate change outcomes. They, they do have a history of, of using these um, sort of issues as a protectionist measure. So as while there is opportunities in trade as well around this issue, I just do want to sort of um, sort of note a sound of caution that I don't think European Union necessarily um, is doing this to to get a great um, carbon outcome. Um, nevertheless, it could be a, a byproduct of, of, of what they're doing. And the, the next set of um, sort of opportunities for the, the farming sector could be around government policy. And I'll, I'll use the European Union example. They have a um, a massive subsidy to the agricultural sector around um, reforestation and land management and you know people have um, valued that from anywhere between five to about 20 percent of um, revenue for farmers in some European Union states so um, it's very much the environment and and sort of um, sustainability issues have very much become a source of income for European farmers uh, as opposed to an impost and maybe um we can look at particularly market mechanisms where we can incentivize um, Australian farmers to get the most out of this um, journey towards uh, net zero emissions. Now, I think I might stop there because I think I've probably hit my 20 minute mark, but look, I'm happy to take questions um, at the end or at the end of the, the talks today. And thank you to the farmers for climate action. Uh, thank you, Ash. That was a, uh, a fantastic, um opening of uh, dis the trade discussions. And I was also pleased to hear the um, positive um, benefits for agriculture that we might do. It's not all gloom and doom. We can, um, we can go forward with a positive face if we, if we pay attention and, and work together, I think. Um, now I'd like to um, introduce Angus Island. Um, Angus is, uh, where just where did I do, do that? Angus, is the program manager at Fiber Advocacy and Eco Credentials for the Australian Wool Innovation Limited. Uh, he studied pastoral science at University of New South Wales after leaving the Northern Tablelands. And he has a graduate diploma in um, business from Deakin University. Now, Angus has experience in raw wool specification management and wool research and testing operations, and he was directly contributed to the development of automated wool sampling and testing instrumentation for characteristics such as staple length, staple strength, dark fiber, color, diameter, variability, and yield, which are all used today, as all wool growers know. Uh, so I'd like to um, welcome Angus to our discussion and um, over to you, Angus. Thanks, Peter. Thanks for the opportunity of speaking to the group. Um, on this important area. Now I've got a, um, a PowerPoint presentation to help get some of the concepts across. Are you seeing that now? Not at the moment. So I'm yeah, trying to share, you share screens my screen. up. Yep. So I've clicked on share screen, but I, is that working now? Um, no, it's, it should work. You're, just a minute. Uh, yes, you're a co-host. You should be able to screen. Uh, Claire or Fiona, can you maybe put, the, put it up? Just opening it up now.
build. Ah, there we go. It's starting. Looks like it's starting now. So I think I'm sharing my screen now. Can you see that? Uh, yes, I can see it, but we haven't got the. Uh, we're still on your computer screen, not the full presentation. Oh, I'll I'm on the full the, presentation, uh, I think, Pete. Um, ah, there we are. Yeah. That's better. Yep, now we've got it. Okay, so sorry for the delay, um, <laughs> but um, yeah, look, it's it's good to be able to talk to you about the trade implications of climate action and. Um, here we're talking about climate action at the global scale. Uh, so on, on this side of the planet, um, we have farmers for climate action. And on the opposite side of the planet, we have a group that I'm calling consumers for climate action. As Ash pointed out, the EU have made clear they want to be the global leaders on sustainability, and they want to use European consumers to achieve this by shining a light on the environmental footprint of every product sold in the EU. Uh, they call it PEF, uh, which stands for Product Environmental Footprint. And uh, it's a comprehensive initiative. I've shown on the left-hand side of the screen, the 16 different impact areas that they'll be assessing for each product. So it ranges from climate change, uh, it starts with climate change, ozone depletion, goes all the way down to things like land use, water use and resource use. And um, it's clearly a, a commendable initiative and it applies to whatever's sold in the EU. So if it's a wool, woolen jumper or a car or an aeroplane, they'll all have a label on them showing the size of that, that product's footprint uh, um, calculated in accordance with the PEF methodology. Um, and the question for today is whether that, uh, whether PEF could represent a, a, a trade barrier for products grown in, in faraway places, a long way away from the European Union, like in Australia. And uh, PEF has been underway for the best part of, of a decade. Um, they're really doing the hard yards on developing this system. And um, our, our view is that um, other domains in Asia and the Americas might simply adopt the European system uh, um, rather than redoing all the work and creating their own. So we're really committed to um, trying to engage with the EU and, and contribute to their methodology to minimise the harm uh, to Australian products. Um, the, um, it's the, the, they're on a short time frame. Uh, they're currently going through the transition phase and they're, they're looking to put policy in place very soon, uh, as early as 2021 or 2022. And, uh, and uh, the, the main concern for us is that they legislate and mandate uh, adoption of PEF scoring before the system is robust and meaningful. So I'd like just to give a few examples from my industry, from the textile industry, as to why they're concerned. Um, this graph, which I hope you can see now, is uh, shows the world uh, fibre production. And wool is actually the thin green line at the top of that graph. And it, currently it's only about 1% of the global fibre supply by, by weight. But if you were to look at that a different way and, and look at it by price, wool would be about 8% of the global fibre supply because it's a highly valued fibre. Cotton is about 20%. But the elephant in the room is polyester, which is more than 60% of, of the global fibre supply. Uh, so our world is becoming swamped by these plastic fibres. And now for a, quick, a, a few fast facts about the textile industry. It's the world's third biggest manufacturing industry after automotives and technology. Um, across the full life cycle of clothing, it has an annual carbon footprint of 3.3 billion tonnes of carbon, which is equivalent to uh, the carbon footprint of the whole of the EU. And uh, globally, the fashion industry consumes an estimated 79 billion cubic metres of fresh water every year. Um, and I don't know how much you know about the microplastic problem because the science is still coming in, but clothing, particularly synthetic clothing, is a major contributor to the, to the microplastic problem. A single domestic washing of clothing can, can release as many as 700,000 plastic fibres. 
And if you were then to go and put it in the tumble dryer, you'd probably release as many as again to the, to the atmosphere. So there's plenty of reasons why the EU want to uh, shrink the fo footprint of the textile industry. And, the, and in terms of risks to Australian agriculture, I suppose the biggest risk is that our products score worse than our competitors and, and we lose demand. And uh, just to give a few examples for this, um, PEF is built on life cycle assessment methodology, and that's a young science which is still evolving. And currently it disadvantages natural products uh, when they're compared against synthetic problem products. So I'd like to sort of talk to that a bit more in a moment. As we've seen, there's 16 environmental impacts that they they account for, and some of these have never been studied in the Australian environment. So we just don't quite know how we'll go in that regard. And it, ultimately they will al amalgamate the 16 impacts into one figure that, that they want to put under the nose of consumers to let them make that choice for the planet or otherwise. And to, to amalgamate them, they have to weight them. And, and how much weight do you give to greenhouse gases versus energy use versus water use, land use, and so on? There's a, that, that's a, a, a um, value judgment, which will affect the final score. Um, and we'll also talk to that. Um, so just on this area of life cycle assessment being a young science, we don't yet know how PEF will score different apparel products. Um, but we get some insights from the Sustainable Apparel Coalition score, scoring system because it's also built on, on life cycle assessment. And you can see in this figure that wool and cotton on the left hand side here with, the, uh, uh, with all the other natural fibres at the bad end of the, their rating system. Whereas oil based fibres, nylon and polyester are at the good end of the, of the rating system. So you get this somewhat incongruous situation where fossil fuel based fibres um, are shown as sustainable, even though that oil will eventually run out and natural fibres, which can be regrown every year while ever the sun shines and the rain falls are shown as unsustainable. And there's a number of reasons why this system is not yet meaningful and why it's flawed. Um, and just as an example uh, um, of life cycle assessment being a young science, it, uh, it presumes that all raw materials are extracted from the earth, that they're mined. But of course, uh, crops like cotton and wool are grown, they're not mined. And because they're grown, the, the environmental impacts of growing them are readily measured. Um, you can measure how much land a cotton farm or a wool farm uses. You can, you can see how much petrol uh, diesel energy that they use and electricity. You can account for the water that's irrigated on the crop and the crop or uh, drunk by the sheep. And, and you can account for waste streams, you know, in, in Cotton's case, it might be uh, nutrients from fertilizers that make its way into waterways and then sheep, it's, it's urine and manure. But you can also account for greenhouse gases, uh, cotton, um, it's nitrous oxide primarily. Uh, and in, in the case of, of sheep, it's, it's the methane that they belch up from digesting pasture. And the point here is that all of these things, all of these inputs and outputs are, are readily measured and accounted for in life cycle assessment for natural fibers. But when it comes to oil-based fibers, their raw material just bubbles out of the ground free of any environmental footprint they only start scoring polyester from the wellhead and onwards. So, so they get a, their raw material comes with no footprint, whereas the raw material for cotton and wool has to be grown and, and comes already with a heavy footprint from the farm. It's not a level playing field. Um, and uh, this has to be addressed when you're comparing natural products with, with synthetic products. Um, also, um, we briefly touched on microplastics, how big a bigger problem it is, and, and that it's the textile industry that's dominating this area. Um, but that's not one of the 16 impacts that the European unions have mandated. So it will be just ignored. Um, so it's another example of an unlevel playing field in, in life cycle assessment. 
Um, we have concerns that they're using Eurocentric methodology, which really doesn't relate to the Australian agricultural environment. Uh, they've got de default values for greenhouse gas emissions from crops, which are much higher than Australia. They have global warming potential values from livestock, the methane that comes from livestock, which also is much higher than used in Australia. And when they amalgamate those 16 scores together to come out with one value, they're using a disproportionately high weighting factor for greenhouse gases. Um, they're using the AWARE, the, uh, sorry, the AWARE water stress method, which, which generates really high impacts for Australian agriculture because our continent is one of the most water stressed continents on the planet. Um, so irrigated crops will be uh, get a, a hard, uh, you know, high score from, from, from that method. And our aged uh, soils, soils our, our weathered and uh, less fertile soils in Europe may, may score against us as well. Um, eutrophication is the release of nutrients into the environment, into waterways, into the air and onto the land, and they score all of those, so it will get a big score as well. So in a nutshell, our concern is that the PEF scoring might lead to the loss of Australia's clean and green reputation. And as we all know, once you lose a reputation, it's hard to get it back again. Um, so uh, what are we doing in the EU? Um, uh, the first thing we're doing is we're engaging as strongly as we can at the technical level to contribute to their methodology and improve it so that, so that it doesn't harm or causes the least harm uh, to Australian products. And secondly, we're liaising closely with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade in Brussels, um, that's the Australian department, uh, um, because they're vitally interested to learn from us on the, uh, on the uh, technical side, uh, and we're really interested to learn from them on the policy side. And, and, and uh, they're giving us guidance on, on, on how to try and influence policy, and they're trying to influence them themselves. Our main concern uh, is that they mandate adoption of PEF methodology before it's proven to be robust and meaningful. So this image shows you the overall um, PEF structure. Right at the top is this technical advisory board of elite scientists that decide the rules for all product categories, whether they're a wool jumper, a car or a plane and everything else. And Five Australian RDCs that are listed there are, are contributing, are co collaborating to, to make sure we have strong Australian representation on, on that technical advisory board. And also down at the individual category rules levels, you know, for, for apparel, for dairy, for meat, for wine and, and everything else, we're making sure that we've got representation at that level too, to, uh, to work on the methodology there. Yeah, so in a nutshell, uh, we're working as hard as we can technically to improve uh, um, PEF scoring and also on policy to, to uh, try and influence that um, as well. And I suppose the next question is, what are we doing to lighten the, the footprint of our products, our agricultural products? Um, and the key point here is that to do that properly and the most effectively, you've really got to understand your supply chain. Uh, wool has a long supply chain compared to, say, meat or, or wool, or meat or milk, um, and uh, and we we need to understand every step in our supply chain to understand where those hotspots sit, so that we can focus on the most important areas. So we've recently completed a cradle to grave life cycle assessment for wool. Um, and here are three of the impacts, uh, greenhouse gases, energy and water. And you can see if you wanted to uh, focus on energy, for example, you wouldn't look at the farm uh, to do that. You'd go straight to pro wool processing because it takes a lot of energy to turn greasy wool into a finished woolen garment. Um, but when we do look all the way across the supply chain and the different impact categories, it's greenhouse gases at the farming stage that really uh, come to light. In our view, that's the biggest impact area. We already saw that the European Union gives a lot of weight to this topic. Uh, it, it, it really um, is, gets a lot of weight in those 16 impacts. 
when, when they're amalgamated. Um, and we think this is the area we, we need to most focus on. And so activities that are underway in this area, there's a few. The first one is we, we've got to make sure that methane's contribution to global warming is accounted for properly. Currently they use the GWP 100 method or the Global Warming Potential 100 method. And this method assumes that all greenhouse gases remain in the atmosphere and continue to affect uh, temperature, global temperature for hundreds of years. But that's not true of methane. It actually breaks down after about 10 to 12 years. And uh, fortunately, um, um, well-credentialed climate scientists at Oxford University are pointing to this weakness and, and are suggesting that, that we need to rethink how methane's uh, contribution to global warming should be calculated. And most recently, the United Nations have been listening to that. And only this month, they're forming a technical advisory group on, on reassessing how methane should be accounted for. So, you know, for example, the wool industry is funding an Australian greenhouse gas expert to participate on that working group at the UN. It has a lot of potential. Uh, if, if the method is changed to the one that's being proposed by Oxford University, that column showing the uh, greenhouse gas emissions from wool farms will, will shrink by more than half. Uh, so it's a meaningful uh, area and, and that will make it a lot easier for Australian farms to uh, make the transition to, to climate neutral or, cl or carbon neutral, I should say. Um, and secondly, uh, we do recognise the need to meet market demands and, and the market is clearly demanding that, that the footprint, the carbon footprint of products is reduced. Um, and, and we need to find pathways to mitigate uh, methane emissions at, at the farming stage. So many brands now are, are taking uh, stronger environmental positions, many textile brands, um, and, um, and that represents opportunities for farmers. Um, and uh, here's one, for example, MJ Bale is a, is a high quality Australian menswear brand that, that produce a lot of wool suits. And they've made the commitment that they will be carbon neutral by, by December 2021. Um, and so the farms that they source their, their wool from have to be uh, low carbon farms. Um, and that's, that's an opportunity for those, for those farms because uh, um, they'll, they'll need to get a price premium uh, um, to, be, you know, to, to make a product that is carbon neutral or close to carbon neutral. And, and these are real opportunities. And at AWI, we see it as our role to uh, take as much risk out of that process and uncertainty out of that process as possible uh, for wool growers wanting to do this. Um, so we've commenced a project now, uh, well, we've had it underway for a while now that, that is, is seeking to do that. We, we, it begins with understanding the baseline. So that is the, uh, the, uh, the Australian case study flock emissions and national flock emissions for the last 30 years. And then looking at plausible mitigation strategies for wool producers. So these are things that are uh, like increasing soil carbon. Here we're building on, on the work of other RDCs, MLA has done some good work in this area, but, but things like remineralizing the soil, reestablishing pastures, changing grazing management practices, um, and, and storing carbon in vegetation is an important areas, area, especially trees. Um, the, the third option is, is really getting the sheep to belch up less methane. And, and this can be done via feed additives like the, the seaweed uh, red asparagopsis, um, assuming you can get it to, to uh, sheep in, in the, the pastoral, in the, in, in the paddock. Um, and, and also uh, low methane pastures is, is another effective way. So, so legumes deliver this. Um, and we've been in, investing in, in legumes, you know, highly productive legumes that, that work in drier environments, um, um, products like um, Vicerula and Cerradella. Um, and also Australian shrubs uh, are, are, are are low in methane. So, so saltbush and ragodia are, are, um, are, are methane mitigating uh, species. 
Um, and the fourth area is improving, improving flock productivity. Uh, you know, increasing lambing rates and weaning rates and wool production per head uh, uh, reduces the emission intensity of, of sheep. Um, many of these areas are win-win. You know, they're good for the farm and the farmer, um, and they're and they're good for the environment. And so they, there's a lot to be had in in, in all of these outcomes. Um, but we do need to make sure that the the pathways are feasible uh, and what and understand what the barriers are to achieving them. Um, understanding the economic side is critical. You know, what are the costs and benefits for doing this? Uh, how much of a premium do you need to justify the efforts of, of, of going to low carbon or carbon neutral farms? Yeah, so that's pretty much uh, everything that I really wanted to get across today. So thank you very much for your time. Oh, thank you, Angus. So well, that was a, a very detailed discussion and I'm sure the I'm sure it'll take a little while for everybody to get their head around. Um, now we have, have a number of questions. Uh, so we'll start at the top. Um, and I guess it's a question given that um, Ash brought it up, but does Sainsbury's CNN carbon neutral target include whole supply chain upstream and downstream of the retailer for all, for all greenhouse gases or just CO2? Yeah, look, um, I did sort of um, write it down. I pressed the wrong button to say um, live answer, but yes, um, based on what they've, they've put out, they're looking at focusing upstream, so around recycling, um, waste streams, packaging, and also downstream in terms of uh, mandates um, and sort of uh, metrics and reporting with the suppliers. And um, again, I can't 100% say that, you know, um, whether it's carbon focused or or all emissions focused, but they said that their, their reporting suggests CO2 equivalent, which makes it, to me, assume that um, they're focusing on GHGs as a whole, not just um, carbon. Right, thank you. Um, now, just to be clear, did you answer those other questions um, whilst the discussion was on Ash at all or not? Uh, yeah, yes, yeah, some of them, the ones I had an answer for, I, I did, yes, I did. <laughs> other ones then okay um i have a question here it might be for angus increases in soil carbon have shown decreases in methane emissions by 60 percent um not sure what that means but anyway because <laughs> i haven't got a question um go to the next one so financial markets consumer demand market and trade developments are very obvious and a clean and green position will now be challenged rdc's all taking action as they should. What becomes of tipping points for pivot to government policies? I'm not sure I understand that question either. Um, I think maybe that question is suggesting um, where, when will the government policies on um, on uh, carbon sort of match maybe um, work being done by industry and RDCs. I, I guess the point to make there is, you know, governments are uh, sort of um, elected by by the public, and so it's a, it's a public issue. But uh, I guess the, the greater point to make that these things are happening in any case, um, and so they're not all reliant on, on government action. So yeah, I understand the point around, you know whether government is leading or, or being a laggard on this issue, but I think um, a lot is going to be going to happen regardless of um, government policy. And um, for example, the work of the RDCs and AWI really paints uh, a strong picture around that. Right, um, and the next question is, how do we record and provide evidence Carbon credentials, what I'm called. Ashes. Ash frozen or I've frozen? Uh, you've, you, you lagged a little bit. I've there. frozen. Uh, lagged a bit. Uh, all right, I'll read the question out again, Ash. Sorry. Um, how do we. Uh, yeah, how do we provide, how do we record and provide evidence of on-farm carbon credentials? And look, that's that's a big question and that's a, that's a big bit of work that um, industry is sort of doing with government at the moment, um, not just on carbon, but on 
various um, sort of sustainability and environmental offset programs is what activities are required to demonstrate that, that you're doing what you say you're doing? How do you verify that? Um, and then that verification process being um, robust, but also achievable, um, and then, then reporting on it. So um, it, it is an open question. We, we have a, a project with the federal government at the moment where we're finalizing around what some of these, um, uh, how we can sort of move towards some of these things, but it, it's a very good question. Um, not easy, but uh, work has been done. And again, work, um, the combination of science and practicality behind it, I guess, is the, the short answer. Okay, um, now one for Angus. What, what do you feel Australian domestic brands can do to support the cotton and wool industries in, in country and help support them in becoming carbon neutral? Look, I, I, this sort of goes to the previous question. I, I think the, the, the burden of, of farmers showing their environmental credentials, you know, shouldn't just be borne by farmers on their own because, you know, it's quite a cost to measuring the footprint of your farm. And, and I think brands have an opportunity, especially when they're establishing relationships with farmers and supply chains that they want to continue that, that they, they, they also can contribute to that and, and potentially share the cost of proving the, the, the light footprint of the farms that they source from. I know the Caring Group are considering this. You know, they represent, I think, 14 or 15 large brands and, and um, they wanna make sure that, that they are sourcing from, from responsible farms and, and uh, they, they are contemplating contributing to that process to demonstrate that those farms are indeed, or do indeed have a light footprint. Right, um, now, I'm just wondering myself personally with your slide presentation on the, uh, on the PEF um, analysis showing natural fibers being worse than than um, fossil fuel derived fibers. If we change to the Oxford um, CO2 um, method, will that have a dramatic impact on that or, or is it only gonna be a marginal impact? Oh no, it would, it would have a, um, a, a quite a large impact on that just because um, greenhouse gases, uh, well, are, they're our biggest they're in the wool industry's case, they're our biggest impact and they get the highest weighting in the EU. So, so it's a double whammy really for the wool industry. Uh, not only do we have methane, but it gets, it gets a big weighting in, in the EU. So if that could be halved or even perhaps further reduced, um, it can really shrink the footprint. Very good. Um, and there's a question here from John Moratelli. Is there an argument for looking at less water hungry natural fibers, e.g. hemp? I don't know. I, I look, I think uh, um, from a producer perspective, um, if, they, um, if they see opportunities in, you know, I don't want to discourage anyone from growing wool, uh, um, but, but uh, if they see opportunities for lighter footprint products that they think are, um, are, are, are well suited to their farming operations, you know, that is a decision uh, that farmers make every day. Right. Um, and another question from David Campbell. Um, and I think this is, is relating to what's happening a bit with our um, carryover credits, I'm not sure, but surely the current EU and FTA negotiations must be altering our government with China next. Do you have any comments on that, Ash or Angus? Yeah, look, I, I think there's, we've got to divorce two issues here. One is um, the issue around trade and trade barriers and the other issues around um, the, the benefits and costs of um, environmental performance, including um, on, on, on climate change. Some of the things that EU do, um, to, to, to Angus's points, aren't necessarily achieving the outcomes that they're saying they're achieving, and in fact, then becomes a barrier to trade. And I, I think we need to be alive to that, um, while not throwing the, the baby out with the bathwater around trying to improve our um, environmental credentials and our um, climate change um, or, or carbon performance. So, 
um, the, I'll give you an example outside of sort of the, the, the environmental space around um, geographical indicators where they, you know, say, you know, because of the beautiful air and, you know, because the, the pigs have been massaged in a certain way that, you know, you can't call certain products um, those products. Um, it has to come from that specific region with the, the hand of a European, you know, stroking that animal. And then when you go dig deeply into these um, geographical indicators, like for uh, the Bressola, I think it's a dried meat product, um, the beef comes from Brazil, from, you know, um, cleared rainforests. So, um, you know, th th there's a bit of a myth around some of the stuff that you, you do versus the reality. And we have to push back on those things that are barriers, but at the same time, continue to work on um, and accept that, you know, um, environmental credentials and clean uh, green credentials are becoming more important. All right, well, that looks like um, we're sort of out of questions for the moment. Uh, and I'd like to thank uh, Ash and Angus for uh, providing a quite uh, deep dive into trade and, and uh, carbon input, uh, carbon issues. Um, so if there's no further questions, I think we'll call that a day right on time at one o'clock. Thank you very much for everybody for attending. Uh, there will be a um, copy of this up and I notice um, Somebody's asked for a reference to the Oxford Uni work. If I can find one, um, Angus might be able to help me with that. Um, we'll put that up with the uh, with the report of this this webinar. So yeah, I'll thank be you able everybody. To send that through. Okay, thanks, Angus. Everybody else, thank you very much.